Hey guys, it's Jacob here with Waterwell FAQ. And today we're gonna to be talking about troubleshooting and diagnosing uh, submersible well pump control panels. And I'm gonna dive into testing each individual component within this box to figure out what happened to the box, um, what component failed, and try to help us find out if there's a larger underlying issue with our system. Um, I have in front of me a three horsepower, single phase, 230 volt deluxe box. I'm gonna be using the deluxe box for this example because it has all the same components as a standard box and a QD box, um, like we discussed in the previous video. And so that'll allow us to test each individual component and the, the test additional contactor that this box has that the others do not. The procedure's gonna be the same no matter which box you have. The readings will be the same no matter which box you have. So, first thing we're gonna do before we even take the cover off the box, um, if you're doing this in the field, is turn the power off at the breaker. Um, turn the power off the breaker. Don't utilize a switch. Um, I know some pressure switches have a mechanical lever to disengage the switch. Don't rely on that. Turn it off at the breaker. After you have it turned off at the breaker, go ahead and take the cover off the box. I like to go ahead and take my screw that holds the lid on and put it back into the uh, base of the box here so I don't lose it. Um, too many times have I set it down and, and forgot where I set it, you kick it and you lose it, and now you don't have a screw to put back on the lid. So just a easy thing to do is just to thread it back into the hole there. So once I have the cover off, I'm gonna take my uh, multimeter and I'm gonna set it to AC volts. And I'm just gonna check to make sure I do not have any voltage. And I'm gonna do that by checking L1, L2, make sure I don't have anything. And then I'm gonna go ground to L1 and L2 and make sure that I don't have anything. That way I know I'm safe to test inside this box now. So the first thing we're going to test is gonna be our overloads. So to do that, we're gonna measure everything within this box in ohms. So I'm gonna take my digital meter and I'm gonna turn it to ohms. Now you may be using an analog meter such as the Simpson analog meter. And to be honest, most motor manufacturers and pump control panel manufacturers still print their testing procedures referencing um, using an analog meter. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna teach you how to translate those instructions into uh, uh, digital. So you can use a digital meter set to ohms um, so you don't have to worry about carrying an analog meter. But if you have an analog meter, don't worry. Uh, we're, gonna, we're, gonna, we're gonna talk about that too. So first thing we're gonna do again, set to ohms. Now, to test the overloads, we're gonna be in R times one if you have a analog meter. For us, with the digital, we're gonna press the range button until we get to just the ohm symbol. If you keep pressing, you'll see there's a K and then the ohm symbol that stands for thousands of ohms, which would be equivalent to an R times 1000 on an analog. And then if you have, keep pressing, you'll see an M, a capital M and then the ohm symbol. That's mega ohms, that's in millions of ohms. So we're gonna just be in just the ohm range is what we're gonna be in. So normally at this point with an analog meter, you take your two clamps together and then you would use the uh, a zero adjustment knob to zero out your meter. With the digital meter, we can't do that. So what we have to do is we have to figure out what our zero is. Our zero, when we touch the two tips of the leads together is 0 0.3. Now that's from my meter, your meter may be different. So be sure to use the numbers from your meter. So again, we'll double check it, we're at 0 0.3. So I'm gonna take one, of, one lead, one probe and touch it to one side of the overload and take my other probe and touch it to the opposite side of the overload. I'm getting a 0 0.3. We know my zero was 0 0.3, so when I subtract the two, I get a zero. The manufacturer says for an overload to be good, the reading cannot be more than 0 0.5. So we can't have more than 0 0.5 ohms of resistance across this overload for it to be good. We have zero ohms of resistance, which shows me this is good. The other thing, I'm, let's go ahead and check this other one real fast. 0 0.3, let's verify our zero. 0 0.3, so that one's good. The other thing I, I should mention when testing your overloads is before you test the overloads, make sure that they're not tripped. And by that, I mean you're gonna press the reset buttons on the bottom of the box. Mm -hmm. You'll notice that they're very spongy, they're very soft. And so what you're gonna do is you're gonna press until you feel resistance to get to the bottom of the but and then that's when you're really going to apply force. I see too many people just kind of lightly push on it till they feel it stop and say, oh, it's not tripped because it's not resetting. 
you've got to apply some force to them to, to really know for sure that they're not tripped. So after we've tested our overloads, now that we know that they're good, we're going to move on to our capacitors. Um, this is probably one of the most common points of failure in the box. Um, it's going to be your capacitor. Um, and so our testing procedure is going to be the same for the start or run capacitor. The first thing you're going to do is you're going to remove one lead from each capacitor. Now a little trick is there is a wire here that jumps between each capacitor. It's a little black wire here. If I remove it just from one side, that services as removing the lead, uh, a lead off of each capacitor. So with still set on ohms, I'm going to press this button until I get to thousands. Okay, so if you're using an analog meter, you're gonna be at R times 1000. And so now that we're set here, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take one of my leads and touch to one post on one side of the capacitor and take my other lead and touch to one post on the opposite side of the capacitor. Now, if you saw it, it started really low, climbed until it maxed out and then went to OL. That's over limit. The manufacturer says that if you're using an analog meter, it should swing, the needle should swing to zero, then swing back towards infinity. That's what our digital meter just did. It was at zero, rose until it hit its limit, displayed OL over limit. That's equivalent to an analog meter's infinity. So we know that capacitor is good. If it were to stop and give us an actual number, um, or if your analog meter doesn't reach infinity, it's somewhere in between zero and infinity, that tells you that that capacitor is bad and it should be replaced. So you repeat that process for your run capacitor and make sure that it, it checks out okay as well. So I'm gonna go ahead and reconnect this wire here so don't forget about it. The next thing we're gonna test moving on is the relay itself. So there's gonna be two parts to this relay we're gonna test. We're gonna test the relay coil and we're gonna test the relay contact inside of it. The first thing we're gonna test is the relay coil. And to do that, I need to disconnect the wire on terminal number five. For me, that's gonna be this yellow wire here on the top right post. Now, each of these terminals is labeled. So this is number five, my bottom right is number two, and my bottom left is number one. So I'm gonna go ahead and remove the wire off of terminal number five. Now, once I have that removed, I'm going to set my meter, <clears throat> make sure my meter is set to 1,000 still, so R times 1,000 if you're using an analog, and uh, to the K if you, make sure your K is displayed if you're using a digital. And I'm going to measure, and it doesn't matter which one, I'm going to put one of my leads on number five, and then my other lead on number two, which is that bottom right red. My meter is ringing at 6.032. That's 6,032 ohms. The manufacturer says that that reading should be between 4,500 and 7,000 ohms. So that tells me that that uh, relay coil is good. So if that number was higher or lower than that, that would indicate that I have a bad relay coil. <clears throat> so we're going to go ahead and again reconnect this wire so we don't forget about it. The second part of the relay we're going to test is the relay contact. And to do that, we need to disconnect the wire from terminal one. Terminal one is gonna be this bottom left. And again, if you ever forget, you can just look on the relay itself, they are numbered. So for me, it's this orange wire here, I'm gonna disconnect it off of one. I'm gonna set my meter to R times uh, one if it's analog, and for digital, press it until you get back to just ohm. So no letter next to the ohm symbol, just the ohm symbol. And then we're going to, we're going to measure across terminal one to terminal two and I am reading a 0 0.3. Make sure my zero, my zero is still a 0.3. So that's gonna tell me my reading is actually three. Or I'm sorry, my reading is actually zero because 0 0.3 minus 0 0.3 um, gives us a reading of zero. The manufacturer says that that reading should be zero. So we are good to go there. Again, if that number is not zero, then that tells you the relay contact inside that relay is bad. So we're gonna go ahead and reconnect this wire. There we go. And then move on. So the last thing we're going to test is the contactor itself. So we're actually going to check the coil inside this contactor. The first thing we're going to do here is we're going to remove one of the leads, either or this black or the yellow, off one side. I like to remove the outside one because it's easier to get to. So I'm going to just move that, remove it. And then I'm going to set my meter to R times 100 if it's an analog meter, but because we have a digital meter, 
We don't have an R times 100 setting. We have basically an R times one or R times 1000, which is K for thousands of ohms. So we're gonna go to, to K, to thousands of ohms in our range. And that's because the manufacturer says that the resistance of that coil should be between 180 and 1400. So R times one, uh, 100 if you're using an analog, but for us digital guys, we're gonna use um, thousands of ohms of K. So I'm gonna just test across the coil by using one probe on one side and the other probe on the opposite side. I'm reading a 1.013, and that's thousands, so it's 1,013 ohms. That falls within our range of 180 to 1,400, so that tells me that my coil is good. So again, I'm gonna go ahead and reconnect my wire. And then while I'm over here on this contactor, I'm gonna go ahead and check it out. I'm gonna check out the contacts itself. I'm just gonna use my probe here, and I'm just gonna kind of pull it back, it's spring-loaded, and just get a view inside to see if I see any burning on the, on the contacts themselves. You know, make sure it's free, make sure it moves freely, and just check the top and check the bottom, make sure those contacts don't have any burning on them. As we discussed in our video on pressure switches, burning in the contacts is generally from arcing, and that arcing can come from bugs and insects getting in between the pads not allowing them to make proper contact can also come from rapid cycling, the on and off. That, on, that rapid on and off creates chattering. You'll hear the sound like that. And that creates arcing, which creates burning of the contacts. Um, if you're seeing burning in your contact on your control box, you're most likely seeing burning on the contacts in your pressure switch as well. So check your pressure switch also um, and see if you see any visible signs of damage there. Do you see any bugs or ants, ants or insects in, in there? If everything looks clean, then you really should be checking your pressure tank. If you have an air over water pressure tank, which we'll discuss in another video, um, check to make sure it's not waterlogged. Waterlogged pressure tanks are probably the number one cause for failures with pressure switches and control boxes. Um, so be sure to check the uh, pressure tank if, you, if you're seeing signs of uh, burning in the contacts. Um, so the last thing I'm doing, um, and honestly, I'm probably doing this while I'm checking each individual component, is just a visual inspection. You know, like I said, check the context. Uh, check the face of the, each capacitor. Do you see any corrosion? Do you see signs that they're leaking? Check the capacitor body themselves. Do you see that, are they bulging? Do they show any signs of damage? Um, check to make sure all of your connections are secure, even if it's a factory installed wire. I mean, go ahead and check them. Make sure that they're tight. You know, mistakes do happen, so we want to make sure all these connections are tight. Check all your connections. Um, and then if everything inside this box checks out good, all the connections are tight, then, then we, we've identified um, that the problem is not within our box, and then we can move forward with our troubleshooting and diagnostic procedure and try to pinpoint um, what's going on. Um, but for the purposes of, of this demonstration, we've determined that our box is good, that there is no trouble, um, and now we can move on. So um, hopefully you've enjoyed this video and you've got some useful information out of it and you can refer back to it when you need. Um, please check out our, uh, our website um, at waterwellfaq.com. Uh, we have some videos on there too. We have, uh, check out our blog, a lot of good information on the blog. Um, tips, tricks, uh, product reviews, tool reviews, um, anything that you guys want to see, reach out to us through our website. Uh, you can uh, hit the contact us now button, uh, email us. Um, you can also comment on our videos. Um, if there's a topic you want us to cover, if you have questions, you know, do not hesitate to reach out to us. So again, if you like this video, um, you'd like to see more content from us, please like and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Uh, and we hope to see you back here soon. Thank you.